There were five bands growing up who had a huge impact on my life, my journey, my musical development, and ultimately that God used to bring me to this place of bowing my knee to Jesus Christ in 1987 as my Lord and my Savior. Those five bands, believe it or not, were ACDC, KISS, Ronnie James Dio, Iron Maiden, and Ozzy Osbourne. Rocking you up for Jesus Christ with classic style hard rock music and practical Bible teaching. On Wednesday, September the 24th, 1980, my dad took me, I was in eighth grade, I was 13 years old. He took me and my buddy Jay Harvey down to Indianapolis to Market Square Arena, a large arena where the Indiana Pacers played, probably had about 20,000 folks for concerts to see ACDC on the Back in Black Tour, my first concert ever. And as I look back on that, I'm like wigged out by it a little bit. I'm like, dude, I mean, for a first concert, that was this is about as epic as it gets. There's no way I can overstate the impact of everything that I experienced that night on my heart. The sights, the sounds, the smells. I was a kid who had grown up in church and I had been introduced to this music. I had never seen a party. I had never seen that culture, that world of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, that whole vibe. I'd never experienced it. And here I am, I'm surrounded by it in spades, right? And I'm seeing the looks and the feel, and just the whole vibe of that crowd. And I remember one time me and Jay were like, What's that smell, man? This kind of sweet, like smoky smell. And it's like, oh, okay. So that's what it smells like when a couple of people are getting stoned in front of you a couple rows down. This is how naive I was as a kid, okay? In this massive arena, we were kind of back around the arena, kind of curved around in the back. And we were about halfway up on that curve. Really great seats as far as seeing everything, a little bit farther from the stage, but there we were. And when the lights went out, the opening band's name was Gamma. I had no idea. I didn't know there was going to be an opening band. I didn't know anything, man. And they start playing. And Jay Harvey and I are talking to each other, like trying to talk. I mean, it's super loud, but it's like, is this ACDC? What? I don't, I don't know this song. Do you know this song? Like, no, I don't know this song. And honestly, we weren't very impressed. It's like, if, if this is it, I'm like, okay, whatever. It just wasn't all that impressive. It was okay, nothing against Gamma, but it just wasn't all that. And then that show ended, and we're like, okay, nobody's leaving. I guess we stick around, right? Like, that wasn't ACDC. They didn't play any song. I mean, seriously, we were that naive. It was obvious that they were preparing for the next show down there on the stage, getting things ready, and so we hung around. And when the lights went out the next time, totally different experience. The lights go out, 20,000 Bic lighters. That's back when we actually didn't use cell phones. It was the real deal, right? Flames or light this whole place up. I'm blown away. I'm looking at the crowd as much as I'm looking at anything else. The roar of the crowd was overwhelming. I, I, I've been to thousands of concerts, man, and what feels like thousands of concerts since then. But this one sticks with me because it was my first one. I was like, whoa, what is going on? A single spotlight comes on and it shines on this huge, massive brass bell with the letters ACDC printed across it. And it's ringing. You know, it's exactly mimicking. It, it is giving off the sound of the opening uh, song for, for Hell's Bells. And it's starting to descend slowly. And the the spotlight is on it and there's nothing else on the stage. I mean, you see the drum kit, but there's nobody else there. The crowd's going nuts. The bell continues to lower and eventually Brian Johnson comes out when it gets about three foot off the stage. He has this huge mallet. The crowd is going bonkers and he hits the bell once. And everybody's going, and I mean, it just feels like it's going to explode. And the third time he hits it, this is when my life changed. Okay, that's the only way I know how to say it. Angus Young steps on to the stage from where I was seated from the right side, comes out from behind onto the stage, just one more spotlight on him, nothing else, playing the opening riff to Hell's Bells. I've said this a thousand times when I tell this story. I fell down in my heart at the altar of Angus Young. It was the coolest thing I'd ever experienced in my life, and I began to worship this dude. I mean, if you've ever seen ACDC, Angus Young has a persona and a presence on stage that is undescribable. If you've seen it, you don't need a description. If you haven't seen it, I can't describe it to you. It's just over the top amazing. They launched into that song. I'm 55 years old as I record this video. I still feel that. I still get goosebumps. I saw them five more times and it was awesome. But that first time, phew. Of course, the way God used ACDC to impact my life had very little to do with their lyrical content. It's obvious. I mean, they're not rocking for Jesus, okay? We'll say it that way. They're, they're singing about the stuff of the world and the flesh. Although there were some lyrics that God used to really bother my heart and stir me up and help me to see a clear distinction between light and darkness. I'm on the highway. So don't worry about tomorrow. 
Take it today. Forget about the check. We'll get hell to pay. Shoot to thrill. Play to kill. Too many women and too many pills. Just something in my spirit that always knew when I heard that line. That ain't good, man. That's just not good. I don't want to be that person. Of course, when I was in the midst of the party scene, I just kind of sloughed it off. I just kind of ignored it. I don't listen to the lyrics, man. I just like the music. You ever heard that before? Musically, ACDC was one of the most influential bands ever on my life, though. I mean, they had an infectious tightness and groove and attitude and vibe that was killer. The over-the-top, solid work of Phil Rudd and Cliff Williams, the groove, the pocket, it was undeniable. The gutsy, soulful, from the heart, even if the lyrics were not all that edifying, but the work of Bon Scott and Brian Johnson, it was just perfectly suited for that music and that vibe. The amazing and I think incredibly underrated work of Malcolm Young, the riffs that that man came up with were just phenomenal. And as I've already stated, the indescribable work of Angus Young, the bluesy, passionate guitar leads that he laid down and the way that he played them and his persona on stage was just, I mean, the whole package. If you can't figure it out, I was pretty impacted by this band. The negative side of that evening when I fell down at the altar of Angus Young and I began to worship him, which should be the case anytime you fall down and worship a false god, is I was led down a path that was dark, that was destructive. From 13 to 15, I took a lot of different turns that led me right into the bottom of the pit of the sex, drugs, and rock and roll world, man. I just immersed myself into it and had all the highs and lows that went with it. The positive side was the musical influence that it had on me. It inspired me. That evening inspired me. It took me a couple of years to save up the money to buy my first guitar, but it inspired me to play guitar. For two years, I did air guitar concerts in my basement, man, to ACDC's music, you know, and then I eventually got a guitar and I was dedicated, in large part because of that vision of those five seconds of seeing him come out on stage that first time. And then when, by the pure grace of God, God called me out of that world of darkness and into the kingdom of the son he loves and I bowed my knee and I gave my heart to Christ. It was still a few years down the road but in the early 2000s when God opened my eyes to the possibility and the technologies that were available that I could actually set up a home recording studio and that I could create an online presence and that I could begin to write music for his glory and record it and create messages like this and put them up on the web and glorify him and reach out to people and rock you up for Jesus. All of that, in part, has roots that go back to my experiences with ACDC. I wouldn't be who I am today as a follower of Jesus if that chapter wasn't part of my story. Romans 8.28 says that we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. So if you've experienced that call, the call, you heard the gospel, and you experienced the conviction that you were a sinner, the Holy Spirit broke your heart and you realized, I need a savior. You were called out of your old life into a new one. All of a sudden, your whole story changes. Outside of Christ, you look back on your life and you go, wow, look at all that brokenness. But in Christ, you start to say, oh, no, 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 he redefined even my past. Look at all those times I was stumbling and struggling, but now I see how God was used using it to shape things, to create mindsets, things in my heart that now in a redeemed state are part of my story of, wow, glory to you, God. Thank you for saving me through this. Thank you for redeeming that part of my life so that now I am who I am in Christ and I can glorify you with it. I am the poster child, man. I am the typical first generation KISS fan. KISS has been around so long now that they have fans in multiple generations. But if you listen to any of the interviews of the original four members, Peter or Ace or Paul or Gene, they'll all talk about those first three albums. But then they'll talk about KISS Alive that came out in September of 1975. And that album blew up. That album drew in that original fan base that made them this huge sensation. I was part of that. Group. Early 1976, so shortly after Kiss Alive came out, I'm in fourth grade and I'm over at my friends Billy and Darren's house and we're in their bedroom. We always listen to music or did whatever and they pull out this album Kiss Alive. I've never seen anything like this before. That album cover of them playing live with Ace you know, back like that and Gene doing his thing and all that. It was just like, whoa, I've never seen anything like that. And then you opened it up and there were these handwritten letters. You remember the, the letters that were on the inside cover? I don't remember what they said. You know, I'm a fourth grader. I'm just enamored. I'm just like, this is like freaky awesome. You turn it onto the back. Never seen a hole like that. It was Cobo Hall filled with all these 
fans and those guys holding that poster of the band and I was just totally hooked. In fourth grade it wasn't like I went out and bought a lot of albums or anything like that but I did buy my first Kiss album in 1977 when Love Gun came out and then a little later that year Kiss Alive 2 came out. I can't even put into words how that album impacted my life. I just thought it was the coolest thing ever. Front cover with the four pictures of them and then you open it up and you see this picture. Is that crazy or what? KISS was massive during those days. It's hard to describe. You wanted the best. You got the best. The hottest band in the world. KISS. I mean, it's just... Dude, my bedroom walls, and I'm not saying this was necessarily a good thing. This was part of my dark walk through the valley of unfaithfulness to God. I was worshiping these bands, but my walls were packed with pictures of bands. I mean, literally, you couldn't see an inch of the wall anywhere. And a big part of that was KISS posters. I had two massive, I think they were about five foot by three foot. They were huge posters. One of them was from the KISS Alive era. In the middle of the poster was a huge full stage picture of the band. And then the upper left corner, upper right corner, bottom left and bottom right were split up into these montages. One up in the upper left was one member and the other was another band member and down you know, so and so. And then I had another of that poster of that same size from Kiss Alive 2. I had this iconic poster of Ace Freely playing his guitar during his solo, leaning back like this, and it's and it's all smoke's coming out of it. I can still see scenes of Kiss Meets the Phantom in my mind. Granted, it's not that I necessarily want to keep them there. I mean, that truly was Velveeta cheesy, right? But anyway, it was part of the experience. I think it was around 1977-ish, Jay Harvey, my buddy, who was my friend who went to that first ACDC concert with me that I talked about in the previous video. Video. He came over and I painted his face up. We didn't have the right kind of makeup, but we did the best we could, right? We made his face white and I think one side of his face I did like the Gene Simmons thing and the other side I did the star and I put my speakers up in my bedroom window and Jay crawled through that window first and got on the, the roof of our garage. You remember when you were a kid how like if you were 12 or 13 and there were kids who were 7 and 8, you were the big kid and they were the little kids, right? And we had that dynamic going on. And so the little kids came and they all sat on our driveway. We put a floodlight on Jay. I put my speaker up in my bedroom window, cranked it up to 11, put on Kiss Alive 2. And Jay stood out on the roof and did air guitar to Kiss Alive 2. And all the kids in the driveway were like, oh. This is awesome. And we put Lavoris. Now, do you remember what Lavoris was? It's this old school mouthwash and it was red. And of course, that was supposed to be the blood. And he spit it out on all the kids down there on the driveway. Ah! It was just one of those silly kid memories. But that's just kind of how into Kiss we were. I still have a bunch of Kiss lyrics in my head. I really wish I didn't have those lyrics in my head, to be honest, because we all know Kiss was 99.999% into hedonism and lust. That's just what they were about. But in those days, I was not a believer. I was not living for Jesus. So my eyes were blind to the things of God. And like everybody else, I just said, hey man, I just listen to the music, man. I don't listen to the lyrics. And yet somehow I have all these these lyrics still in my head and I can sing all of them. Can you relate? Jesus in John chapter 3 verse 3 when he's talking to Nicodemus who is a Pharisee and they're having a talk about being born again. Jesus says there in John 3 3 unless you're born again unless you're born literally that phrase means from above born of the spirit you can't see the kingdom of God. It's the spirit who opens your eyes to the things of God when you're born anew. I couldn't see. I was blind. But musically, oh my goodness, Kiss was the soundtrack of my early life. They just were. I played all their albums nonstop. Ace Freely, especially in those early days, man, he laid down some iconic licks that shaped not just me as a guitar player, but a whole generation of guitar players. His guitar solo on Kiss Alive 2, I can still hear it note for note in my head. And it truly was something that was a moment in time for me. Of course, as I got a little bit older, man, I wanted to see Kiss in concert so badly. I wanted them to be my first concert in 1979. They came to Indianapolis on the Dynasty Tour. I was in 6th or right between 6th and 7th grade at that time and I just wasn't allowed to go. But some of my friends went and I still remember a buddy, Donnie Massey, who went and we were talking about it. And that was one of the first years that Gene Simmons was hooked up with the wires and he like flew up into the light rig and that whole thing. That was the big deal back then. I loved The Elder. Does that tell you anything about the kind of Kiss fan I was? I mean, dude, that was the biggest flop they ever put out and I thought it was cool. In 1983, Kiss came to Indianapolis on the Creatures of the Night Tour and I was there front row on Gene's side of the stage, two foot from the dude as he's doing his thing, and it blew me away. One of the weird things about that show was nobody knew that Ace Freely was out of the band at that time. 
Okay, so Vinny Vincent was the guitar player. So here comes this guy and he's playing lead guitar and he's playing this pink Jackson V. And I'm like, what? I never saw him play that before. And then he's got this gold kind of onk or I think that's what it's called, kind of cross makeup. And I'm like, who is this dude? Nobody knew. And they never said. Paul Stanley never referred to him as Vinny. He never mentioned his name. He never said anything. After the show, we're like, dude, was that Ace? What's up with that? Who was that dude? And then later we found out it was Vinny. And of course, then I saw him on the Lick It Up tour. And then I saw him on the Animalized tour. And then 19. 1986, 1987 rolls around. This is a very pivotal time in my life. I had just graduated from high school. A lot of the decisions I'd made about my life had led me down a path of destruction. I was experiencing a lot of godly sorrow and depression. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 10 says, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation. The part where it ends in salvation is awesome, but I was still in the bummer time of just godly sorrow, and it was just a dark time for me. Matthew chapter 5 verse 3, Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Well, I didn't fully understand what Jesus meant at that time, but what he means is blessed are those who realize they've come to the end of themselves. They've hit the bottom of the barrel and they realize I'm dead in the water, man. I'm crushed. I need some help. And specifically, I need a savior. You got to get to that place where you know you need a savior before you can turn to him. Well, I was on the fast track to that place. So come back to KISS, the asylum tour. They roll into Indianapolis on January 16th, Market Square Arena. And I'm there, front row, this time on Paul's side. Paul's hair at that time on the tour was super long, like like down past his butt. And the KISS logo that year was the largest KISS logo ever. It filled up the entire back of the stage, like, I don't know, 30, 40 feet high and 60 feet wide. It was crazy. Two months later, KISS is going to be back in Indiana in Terre Haute at Indiana State at the Holman Center. So I drive down and I take in that show. That was a really interesting show. First off, I thought it was cool to be in Terre Haute because that is where KISS Army originated, the fan club. It was bootleg city. It's the only place I've really seen this and maybe there was some connection with the KISS Army and all that kind of thing, but there were tables and tables and tables of all these people selling, if you remember what bootlegs were, there were these illegal recordings of live shows and all kinds of cassettes and memorabilia and stuff. It's crazy. At this show, I was also in the front row on the right side, which would be on Paul Stanley's side. And there was this event I'll never forget. Some kid, a few rows behind me, threw a paper cup and hit Paul Stanley. Next thing I know, Gene Simmons comes bolting, because it was one of these moments where Paul was just talking to the crowd. Gene comes bolting out of nowhere, jumps off the stage down, and if you've ever been front row on a show like this, you've got about three foot between the stage and the barricade, okay? And I'm up on the barricade in the front row, and Gene jumps down in the pit where the security guys were, and jumps up over and reaches and grabs this kid and pulls him and puts him up on stage. It's crazy. Of course, then they kind of make fun of this kid, ridicule him a little bit and send him off the stage. And then two days later, yes, I said two days later, Kiss was going to be in Evansville, Indiana, about five hours south of where I lived in Anderson. Me and Michelle Lakey, who was a good friend of mine at the time, she was a beautiful, beautiful girl, just a good friend. And I say she was beautiful because that plays into the story. They were at Roberts Arena. It was an older arena. The whole top section of it was bleachers. So I get there super early. All the shows from that day were general admission. And so I get right up on the doors and I get and I get front row. We're right in the middle. And this roadie, his name's Romeo. I'll never forget this dude. He kind of liked himself a lot. You could tell by the way he kind of carried himself. And he had long hair that looked a lot like Paul Stanley's. He was kind of over a section of the roadies or whatever, doing some kind of management thing. He saw Michelle. I told you she was beautiful. And so he comes out and he gives her a backstage pass. He's going to be her little guide back there and who knows what he had intended or whatever. But she's like, oh, this is awesome because she really liked Paul Stanley. So she goes backstage and I'm standing out there all by myself like, what is up, man. That's a bummer. I mean, I'm happy for Michelle, blah, blah, blah. Well, Michelle, being a good friend, man, she remembered me. And about 25, 30 minutes later, Romeo comes back out with a backstage pass for me. And he gives it to me. And he's not interested in me at all. He's like, whatever, you know, here's your backstage pass. And he, he bolts. I don't know what to do. I'm sitting out front of the stage with a backstage pass. It was one of these deals where you peeled it off and you stuck it on your shirt or whatever. I put it on and I start wandering toward the back, just wondering if anybody's going to say anything to me. I don't even know if anybody said anything to me. It was weird. It was almost like I felt like, dude, even if I didn't have a backstage pass, I might have been able to get back here. I'm sure they saw it. So I get back there and I'm standing back there. And I still remember all these memories. I'm standing back there just... Uh, behind the stage, just a little ways, kind of looking at this big open room where their equipment's just sitting everywhere, all these crates with Kiss written on it and all that kind of thing. The guys are just walking around working, and it came time for the opening band to come on, and it was King Cobra. I don't know if you ever have heard of that band or remember them. They were opening up for Kiss on this tour, and I had seen them twice before, so I was like, I ain't worried about seeing that, but it was cool to see them in the backstage because they were lining up, the lights just went down, the crowd's going wild, and they're all back there kind of high-fiving each other and 
kind of hitting on each other and just getting, they're just like firing each other up to go on stage. And it was funny to see that. And some guy comes out with a flashlight and he led him up to the back of the stage and I saw him go on and I saw the show happen from the back. And it was really interesting to see that perspective. And after that show, I'm just looking around and there's just guys working and, and I saw Bruce Kulik walk by. And he has his hair pulled back in a ponytail and he's just doing his thing. And then I saw Gene walk and they're, they're not hanging together, they're not doing anything, they're just doing... It's another day in the office to them, is really what it felt like. And then here comes Paul Stanley from over here. He had this like, it was a kind of a cream colored coat with gold paisley on it. And here these people all come up to him and I just remember him going, hey, what, what is this, an ambush? I remember him saying that and uh, all these people clamored around him and he was actually very gracious. But here's the deal. I was never one of those people that wanted to bug anybody. I didn't want to be one of those fans that bugged people and ran up to them. Oh, can I have your autograph or whatever? So I just watched that. And then I noticed that right over here to my right, Eric Carr is sitting. He's got his performance clothes on. He's got his, you know, his fandex and some kind of thing and a scarf and all that. His hair's all poofed out. He's just sitting on this crate. And he's just chatting with this guy. And I think he, the guy was a fan. I don't know. And it's probably about 10 foot. And I'm scared to death. And I don't know why. I like get mad at myself when I think about this. But I was so starstruck. I was like, oh, I gotta go. Can I talk to him? I don't know what to do. I mean, I really was, but I could not talk to him. I mean, this was like the moment, right? If you're ever going to get a chance to talk to one of the band members, you got to do it. So I walk up to him. And I had the back part of the paper that had peeled off of my backstage pass. And I don't know where somebody had a Sharpie or I got one somewhere. And I tried to put this sentence together. I'm standing right here talking to Eric. And he looks at me and he says, hey, man, what's up? And I said, will you sign this, please? I mean, I can't even talk. And I remember he kind of rolled his eyes and smiled. He signed it. He gave it to me. He probably would have hung, talked to me. He was cool. And I was like, thank you. And I walked away. And I stood there. And I was embarrassed. I felt stupid because of the way I had acted. There was no way I was going to go back over there. I was already crashing and burning in my own head. And I continued to, to watch some of the things that happened. And then I just walked out front. And all of this is combined with the melancholy and the godly sorrow and all the stuff that's going on in my heart. And I watched them perform. I just walked up in the bleachers and stood up there and watched them perform. And I noticed he's saying the exact same thing he said the other two shows, Paul. You know, it's the exact same thing. It's like rehearsed. It's just ching, ching, ching something happened and it's hard for me to put into words but it was like scales fell off my eyes and I saw things from a totally different perspective and, and here's what it was the whole illusion that I had built up the fantasy of this rock and roll dream of what it means to be a rock star and to live the glamorous life and all the things it all came crashing down in my heart at that moment I was like this is just a job for these dudes I had put them up on this pedestal and it all came crashing down and I'm struggling to really put that into words, but it really did. It fell apart. And I just went into depression. You got to remember, I'm a kid and I had always held them up in this huge, like high place. And, and I had this illusion of the rock star life. And when you combine that with where I was spiritually and the godly sorrow and the season I was in, and I was headed toward the end of my rope and all those kind of things in my heart, something happened that night. And that was like one of the last straws that brought me to my knees and I just crashed and burned. Through that whole season of my life, man, my aspirations of making it in rock and roll were like my whole world. And so all of that's crashing down. And something died inside of me. And I'm thankful that it died, but it hurt really bad at the moment that it died. I hit bottom and I wallowed at the bottom of the barrel for a while before my godly sorrow finally led me in February of 1987 to go to my grandma. If you've heard my song Out of the Hellhole, the opening to that song tells the story of how I went to my grandma. I call her a prophetess of Yahweh in that opening. My whole life she had loved me unconditionally as her grandchild and she loved Jesus. It was so obvious. Everything about grandma was loving Jesus. And I had seen in her repeatedly the joy and the hope that I wanted in my life. And so I go to her and I say, Grandma, my life's a mess. And she pours a message into me saying, Braddy boy, you got to get out of Anderson. You got to get away from this whole scenario, this whole culture. And she suggested that I fly out to Wichita, Kansas, where I had some family who were involved in ministry. That's a whole other story, but I did. I got on the plane, flew out there, and everything changed for me. I came alive in Jesus Christ. It was awesome. God is so good. He allowed me through all of those years in my childhood to build Kiss Up and make them this giant idol in my life. And then as I reach you know, close to 20 years old, to have this season of melancholy and, and godly sorrow and brokenness, and to have that path cross with this moment in Evansville, Indiana, where I get this backstage pass out of the blue. And all of a sudden I see a lot of things for what they are. And the veneer is stripped away. And my whole image of the rock star life that I had built it up to be came crashing down. And God used all of that to bring me to my knees and to turn to him. He used all of that experience to make many parts of me who I am in Christ. 
My best friend all of my life has been Paul Hickner. Now as an adult, we've grown up, we've gone our separate ways, and we don't talk as often as we did. But man, as kids, we were inseparable. We grew up two houses apart. We were together every single day, man. We just came up together. Our teen years were during the golden age of metal, man. It was literally from about 79 to 80. Six. I mean, it's right in the middle of the best of the best. We played guitar. We grew our hair out. We did the whole thing. We went through the depths of brokenness and partying together, all of it. But we loved all these bands, and we were always discovering new bands. And we loved turning each other on to whatever new band we had discovered and listening to music together. Around 1980, 81, I really got into Ozzy Osbourne. I don't remember if it was Paul who discovered him first or me, but we really got into it. It was around that Blizzard of Oz album, Randy Rhodes, all of that stuff. And of course, that led us to discover Black Sabbath because Ozzy had just left Black Sabbath and they had this new lead singer whose name was Ronnie James Dio. Man, I loved those two albums that Ronnie put out with Black Sabbath, Heaven and Hell and Mob Rules. They're just phenomenal albums. I remember this one time I would have been about 13 years old. My cousin Sam, who was 10 years older than me, came over to the house and I really looked up to him. You know, when you're that age, you look up to somebody who's in their 20s and he was a cool dude and he played acoustic guitar pretty well and I thought that was super cool and so he came over and he was a really dedicated Christian okay I was in the midst of being pulled away from God and really getting into this music he loved the Lord he was trying to be a good influence on his cousin he listened to this Black Sabbath tune with me track number three from Mob Rules which was Sign of the Southern Cross which if you've heard it it's classic Dio it's got lots of spiritual overtones and lots of mystical kind of vibes and starts off acoustic and moves into this really heavy you know sound and it's powerful and it's pretty dark too sam listened to it and he was cool he, he didn't slam black sabbath or tell me that i ought to quit listening to him he just tried to you know be my friend and, and love me i remember him mentioning man those guys are really good musicians i don't know why that's just a memory around 1982 dio and black sabbath part ways and dio forms his own band he had jimmy bain on bass vinnie apice that's how i say it. you may say vinnie apice he had been in black sabbath during the mob rules season and he came with Dio and then he had this guy named Vivian Campbell on guitar. Man, Paul and I loved Vivian's playing. We were brand new to playing guitar at this time and Vivian was just, he just had this aggressive style of picking and just going at it that we really loved. Holy Diver comes out in 1983. What an album that was, man. The opening track on that album is Stand Up and Shout. Just out of the gate, hits you in the face, man. What a riff. I didn't even realize it until years later. In 2005, I created an album called Telecaster, and I put a song on there called Surrender. And the opening riff, it's just the power of something getting in your head, and you don't even realize how it influenced you. The opening riff to Surrender sounds so much like Stand Up and Shout. Some other really notable songs on that album were Holy Diver, Don't Talk to Strangers. I did a pair of that song a few years back with Luke Weber on vocals. It's called Beware of Danger. Rainbow in the Dark. Man, still remember that video on MTV? We were just all in to Dio big time. Then Dio's next album called The Last In Line came out in 1984 with another epic opening track, We Rock. Man, what a song. On Tuesday, January 22nd, 1985, Ronnie James Dio and company rolled into Indianapolis. I remember it like it was yesterday, man. So it was January of 85. I graduated from high school in 85 so I just started my final semester of high school dude you know and I am all into the world I am up to here with partying and debauchery and living for the world I got my snowmobile suit on if you remember snowmobile suits there's like this full body suit the insulated supposed to keep you warm and the reason I'm wearing that thing is I'm gonna head down to Indianapolis and I'm gonna get in line and I'm gonna be there all day there's about this much snow on the ground it's super cold I dropped my girlfriend off at Highland High School in Anderson Indiana that morning and I was skipping school so I drove my 1960 Volkswagen Super Beetle down there. It's another reason I needed to wear that super insulated snowmobile suit because the heater didn't work. It was a rust bucket. It was falling apart, but it was my first car and I loved it. So I got down there and I parked and Market Square Arena was this huge arena kind of built like a bull and on two sides of it, it had this multi-level parking garage and you'd walk up these ramps and get up to this mezzanine on either side of it. And we and my friends and I and all the people that loved going to concerts together, we had really fallen in love with this one entrance called Doors 7 and 8. We just thought that was the place to line up because it was all general admission, right? So you got there early to try to get your seats. And we just thought that was the place to enter to get front row. So I get up there before anybody else. I'm like, I'm going to be in the front row. I was, that was my thing. I got front row a lot. And I remember getting up to the top of the ramp and I'm looking across this huge mezzanine and it's this much snow and there's not a single footprint in it. There's nobody up there. The wind's blowing. It's freezing. And I trudge across that snow. <laughs> 
to get to doors seven and eight. I plant myself in front of that door. I froze my tushy off, man. I was there all day. Finally, people started showing up. I remember after that concert, I was sicker than a dog because I just exposed myself to that cold weather all day. But I got the seats I wanted, okay? And the funny thing is, I didn't even want front row at that time. I had been to so many concerts that I was kind of playing around with different spots that I wanted to sit in. So I got there all day so I could get these seats that were about 15, 20 rows back and about seven or eight rows up on the side, okay? And, and we thought they were great seats because you were kind of up a little bit and you could see the whole stage instead of being down on the floor and that kind of thing. So anyway, that's where we sat. You know, it's funny, I did a little research and I looked back on this tour and the tour dates to make sure I got the dates right. And I actually discovered that Dawkin had opened up for Dio and I totally forgot that I saw Dawkin on that tour. 85, I don't know what album that would have been, but uh, I saw Dawkin twice. But anyway, Dio's band was incredible. If you know anything about Dio, you know he's very theatrical, he's very charismatic, he knows how to engage the audience, and I mean he is doing that full force. He always had a great light show, and at that time lasers were a big deal, and he was doing some really cool things with lasers, and I was just really enjoying the show. And then he broke into the song Heaven and Hell, which at the time I really liked. And so he got into that tune, and he's playing it, and we're like getting into it, and we're loving it, and then he gets this place where he breaks it down, and the bass and the drums are doing this little tune just this groove thing and he starts talking to the crowd and working the crowd and he's got this thing that he's worked out you know it's a lot of fun interaction all that kind of thing but the story that he told and you can probably find this online he told a story about two little ships and it was the classic story about having a demon on one shoulder and an angel on the other okay but this was his version of it and he starts off and he says there's a little black ship down below me and, and the music gets really kind of dark. And he had a keyboard player, and the, 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 the vibe just got dark, and the lighting, you know, and, and it was clear he was talking about evil. And he said, and the ship said, come with me, and I'll give you desire. And then, of course, they had those lights across the top that they would light up to light the crowd up, and they kind of came up, and everybody's like, ah! And then the mood shifts and the lighting gets kind of white and there's fog on the stage and it just starts to feel kind of celestial and heavenly. And then he sings, there's a little white ship up above me. And it said, come with me because I know just what to do. And then Dio did something that shocked me, blew me away, cut me to the heart and woke me up. He said, but I said to that white ship, go away. Because I'm going to burn in hell with all of you and you and you. And he points out to all the sections of the arena and the, the bright lights come on that light up the, you know, the audience. The whole crowd goes, Wah! and I'm standing there. I'm just telling you, I'm stunned. I'm looking at the audience cheering about going to hell and celebrating that. And I'm just like, what? What? I mean, I'd probably partied that day. I was probably under the influence of something, but I mean, it all brought me back to sober real quick right there. And I'm like, no way. I am not going to hell. I mean, at that point in my life, I'd been raised in the church and I knew the truth about Jesus. I just didn't want to live for him, right? I wanted to party. I wanted to live in the world. But when he said those words and I saw the response of those people, it was like the opposite. If you remember the ACDC concert, how that moment in the crowd and all of that drew me in, that repelled me. That was like, no way. I don't want anything to do with that. And it really, really impacted my heart. I'm 55 years old as I record this video. I still remember it. Joshua 24 verse 15 captures what I felt that night. Joshua said to the people of Israel, Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I wish I could say that I fell to my knees right then and there and surrendered my life to Jesus, but I didn't. But between that Dio concert and the time that I surrendered my life to Christ, I lived with a new awareness that I had to make a decision. I had to serve somebody. Who was it going to be? And that became more palpable and strong in my life. And I entered this season of godly sorrow because I was under conviction. And God used that moment and Ronnie James Dio to stir that to life in me. <laughs> You heard me talk about my best friend growing up, Paul Hickner, right? And how we came up through music and that whole scene together. And we were always challenging each other in terms of playing guitar and in lots of ways. But we love to discover new music. And whoever discovered that new band, that was always a big deal, right? Full credit to Paul for discovering Iron Maiden. 
If you remember the early 80s, real metal, there was something to the, just that statement. Is that a real metal band, right? Are they just fakers? Are they glam rock? Are they just like that whole hair metal thing? I like a lot of the glam metal bands and hair metal bands and all that stuff. But man, if you were a real metal head, it was like, we're looking for real metal bands. And, and I'm telling you, when we discovered Iron Maiden in 1981, we discovered them on the Killers album. Okay, so this is pretty early, right after their first album, which was simply called Iron Maiden. And man, they had that real genuine authentic metal vibe in spades. I remember listening to their first album just called Iron Maiden and to Killers and how it just felt like we had discovered some rare gem. It didn't seem like anybody else really knew about them at the time. And we just loved everything about their sound and their vibe and, and their songwriting and everything. The Killers album cover had some pretty dark, nasty stuff on it. But you know what? That goes back to what I've said in some previous videos as well, that I was spiritually dead. I was spiritually blind. John chapter three, verse three is where Jesus says, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. You're blind to the things of God. And I was dead, man. I just was blind to those things. So when I saw that album cover, man, I was raised in the church and I, I knew some of that's not good, man, but I was just numb to it. I just blew it off. Paul and I both came up and started playing guitar around the same time, inspired by all of this early eighties metal. And of course, Maiden had a huge impact on us. Paul's first guitar was a knockoff Strat. It wasn't a Fender. It was some other knockoff company. I don't remember what the brand was, but it played, it played nice. And we bought it at Allen's Jewelry. Okay. That was a pawn shop in Anderson, Indiana. He brought that home. And I remember he took it apart. And I don't know what you know about guitars, but with this kind of a Fender type of guitar, you can unbolt the neck, take all the electronics off and everything, get down to just the body. And he hung the body. It was kind of a cream white color. And he hung it up in his shed out behind his house. And I remember hanging out with him and he was always meticulous about doing things right. And so I'm sure it was probably lacquer or whatever he used to spray it with. It was something that would be high quality and he sprayed it black. Then he put it all back together and it looked very much like Dave Murray's mid fifties Fender Strat. Very cool. In March of 1982, Iron Maiden came out with their next album, Number of the Beast. Now, if you're my age, you're into metal, you remember this album. This was massive. The album cover was filled with spiritual, I mean, heavy duty spiritual themes. It had a picture of Eddie, who is the, the band's mascot, with his fingers held out like this, you know, like working a marionette and the marionette or the strings were controlling the devil. And the devil was holding his fingers out and he was controlling some little guy. I mean, there's like this serious like vibe kind of message going on there. There's flames and all kinds of things going on. Massive spiritual themes and, and overtones. And who can forget the opening to the title track, Number of the Beast? Woe to you, O earth and sea. For the devil sends the beast with wrath. Because he knows the time is short. How am I doing, right? That's kind of what it sounded like, man, you know? Let him who hath understanding reckon the number of the beast. For it is a human number. Its number is 666. I mean, you know, it was just like, it, just, it, it was just like, dude. I mean, that was a killer album. Very evocative, and powerful, and, and great songwriting. And the guitar work was just incredible. And by the way, that opening is actually a paraphrase of two scripture references, Revelation chapter 12, verse 12, and Revelation chapter 13, verse 18. I had been raised in the church and I had made a decision a few years prior to really just kind of give myself to the world and I was all into it. But because I still had those seeds of teaching in my heart, man, when I heard references to the devil and to the beast and to evil and to all these things, even though my eyes were blind to the realities of spiritual things in a lot of ways, I still knew, dude, that's real stuff. And it had an impact on me. I didn't do anything with it. It was just kind of conviction. There was always a gnawing at my heart when I heard those things that I'm going to have to reckon with this. I'm going to have to deal with this at some point, but I just kept pushing it down. When I listened to Iron Maiden's music back in the day, man, part of me was just like, this sounds so awesome. I mean, there's a reason that I've parodied three of their songs so far. I've, I've done a parody of Number of the Beast. I've done one of The Trooper and of Aces High. But there's a reason that I've done that because I love their songwriting and their guitar work and their whole approach to telling stories. And they're just a great band. So part of me when I listened to their music was just like, this sounds so awesome. And part of me was always kind of bothered or stirred or aware. I knew that these things were real, that evil was real. The things they were singing about were real and I was going to have to deal with them. And there was just kind of that conflicted thing in me all the time. A major development, of course, that came with the release of their album, Number of the Beast, was a new lead singer named Bruce Dickinson, whom we had never heard of before. He came from a band called Samson, which I had never heard of before then until we started looking it up and all that with, you know, knowing about Bruce. And I had grown so accustomed to Paul Diano's work, and I really liked his work on Killers and the earlier album. It took me a while to get used to Bruce. He was kind of operatic, almost sort of 
sounding compared to Paul Diano. Took me a while for him to grow on me. But of course, boy, did he ever grow on me. And it came to be that you couldn't imagine Iron Maiden without Bruce Dickinson, right? I mean, he did some incredible work with that band. Sunday, May 23rd, 1982, Iron Maiden came to Indianapolis to the Indianapolis Convention Center on the Number of the Beast tour. And I was so bummed because I wasn't able to go. You see, the economy in America wasn't all that great at that time, especially for people in my dad's line of work. He was a used car salesman. He owned his own lot and things were just going south. And we lived in Indiana and his best man in his wedding had moved to Austin, Texas and had lived there for a long time. And he invited us to come down and live with them in Austin, Texas. And so we lived in Texas for the summer of 82 while dad was kind of exploring some options for work because dad was always an entrepreneur, right? He was always just looking for new ways and new places to work for himself. But while we were in Texas, man, I was going to miss this concert and I was so bummed, but Paul went and he came home and just told me how awesome it was. And he got me a t-shirt and it looked sort of like this one, but the one that I had was gray. Okay. As opposed to this black one, man, I wore that thing out. I love that t-shirt. I wore it everywhere. I, I just thought it was the coolest thing ever. Speaking of t-shirts, so let me remind you about the Pastor Brad Rocks t-shirt shop right here's the t-shirt that I wear in all of my videos it's over there and then I also have a lot of other designs I have all my album artwork on t-shirts I have a couple that say Jesus Rocks I'm always trying to come up with new designs if you have some ideas of things you'd like to have on a t-shirt that you think would be cool leave them in the comments I really appreciate the support but I also want you to know I have a bigger dream and hope for these t-shirts than just raising some support think about this you wear one of these t-shirts and you get to declare your love for Christian rock and for God and people say, dude, what, what's that t-shirt all about? Who's this Pastor Brad dude? Oh, he's this pastor who creates, you know, Christian rock music. And the next thing you know, God has moved your conversation in the direction of Jesus. And awesome things can happen. In May of 1983, Peace of Mind came out. They added a new band member. His name was Nico McBrain, who professes to be a follower of Jesus. Very, very, very interesting testimony there. Nico was a phenomenal drummer, and I think he elevated the band. I really do. This was awesome. And his drumming on Peace of Mind was just out of this world. August 7th, 1983, Iron Maiden comes to Indianapolis to Market Square Arena, and I am there. A couple things I remember about that show, besides the fact that it was just totally awesome. They had two bands that opened up for them. This was the year that Fastway had their big hit, Say What You Will. And so Fastway was the opening, opening band. They did a good job, man. They're just kind of a blues rock band. Outside of Say What You Will, at least at that time, it didn't seem like they had a whole lot of material that everybody was totally into. And so the, the crowd was nominally whatever into them. I remember one point we were really close up front. I wasn't quite in the front row, but I was kind of on the left side and the lead singer came over and I remember uh, a Coke cup coming and hitting him like, I don't know if it was in the face or the chest or whatever. Very professional, ignored it, just kept going. I just kind of remember that. I kind of felt bad for him because they were really giving it their all. And um, I just thought that was a little disrespectful. But either way, of course, when they played Say What You Will, things came alive and that was kind of cool. Then there was a band, Coney Hatch, a Canadian band. I loved Coney Hatch. They were sort of like one of these bands that I wouldn't say was one of my all-time favorites, but they were like totally honorable mention. They blew me away that night. They had a vibe. They had a groove to their music that was just really cool. So much so that I did a parody of one of their songs. They had a song called Devil's Deck. My parody of it's called Devil's Neck. And it's about Genesis 3.15, that when the Messiah comes, God will crush his head. And God's got the devil by the neck, man. And, and we don't have to worry anymore. He's been defeated. But either way, this song is, is amazing. They were super cool. Really enjoyed them. And then, as I've already said, Maiden was incredible. And the, the, one of the significant things I remember about that night, August 7th, I'll never forget it. It's Bruce Dickinson's birthday. And I know that because that evening, closer to the end, the band came out and surprised Bruce. He's out there talking to the crowd or whatever. And they all came out. You could tell they were really good friends. So like they were having a lot of fun and they all came out with these big whipped cream pies and the crowd's like, ah, and, and it kind of surprised him and bam, bam, bam. They just pelted him with these pies and he had real long hair at the time and he has whipped cream all through it and the whole thing. Great sport. Just had a ball with the whole thing. Went into whatever their next song was. And if you've ever seen Bruce, he's like Mr. Energy. He's all over the stage and he's just got whipped cream everywhere and he's just having a ball. Very cool memory. Very fun. Now in 1983-84, that was also a time in my life when I was starting to hang out with a guy named Sam Elshire. He had a girlfriend named Lisa Harper, who was a good friend of mine as well. He had a giant mid-70s black Cordoba. Now, this is back when cars were cars. This is back when car doors were like this thick instead of this thick, right? This was like... 
when you shut the door, you knew it, right? Big old boat, but it was a cool car and we would cruise and we just hung out together. We were inseparable for this like year and a half period. I don't know why, but we just, did you ever have a friend like that? That like for a season, you were just super tight and then you weren't so tight. Anyway, we were inseparable. We did everything together. And Sam had a spiritual side to him, very much into the world, very much, you know, not living for Jesus. But he had a brother who was a youth minister at the uh, 38th Street Nazarene Church. And we started going to, I started going to Sunday school with him. I never was anti-God, right? I was just into the world. And so, you know, I enjoyed learning and hearing about the Lord and the gospel and, and learning about the Bible and all those kind of things. And kind of had a little revival time with Sam and his brother. It was really conflicted and messed up. It was like, we we're still partying and doing all the crazy thing, but we're sort of like into God at the same time. So one night, Sam and Lisa and I, somehow we hear about this house that's way out in the boonies, like 15, 20 minutes outside of Anderson in the middle of nowhere in a country road. You ain't been on a country road till you've been out in the middle of nowhere in Indiana on a country road. This house was supposed to be haunted, right? We drove out there the first time. We went out there several times and you'd go way out in the middle of nowhere because it's super pitch dark. There's no other homes, nothing else around. And up on this hill was this big old two-story brick kind of mansion type looking house and all the windows were broken out of it and it was up on this hill up from the road and I mean we'd take you know 30 minutes to drive out there and park and look at it and are you going in I ain't going in man you go in I ain't going in and, and you know maybe we'd walk halfway up the yard and in the dark we'd just get overwhelmingly scared and turn around and go back and this one day we went out there in the daytime and it wasn't quite as scary and we actually went in and I remember I think we went upstairs I, I can't remember it was it was scary because you know it was falling apart but anyway one of the rooms had a big pentagram spray painted it was just some kids probably in there partying but it added to the mystique and it was a big pentagram painted on the wall and all this kind of thing well we drove out there some other time after that at night why do we like to scare ourselves we enjoy it it's weird we drive out there of course there's all the hype all the vibe all the things we're stirring each other up with stories and stuff and after we're out there for a little while we start to drive back and we notice on the side of the road across from where this house was there's a big bonfire and there's people down there doing stuff and Sam, who was not shy about speaking his mind, he said, man, I'm telling you, that's satanic worship going on down there. And I was like, dude, really? And he's like, yeah. And so he's like, you know, burning out of there. And this car comes out from down in that place and starts following us, or at least we perceived it to be following us. And we turned right and it turned right and we turned left and it turned left. And wherever we went, this thing was following us. Now it was a, you know, a good quarter or so mile back behind us. Sam's booking and it's not falling behind. We're like, dude, these Satanists are coming after us. Now, you know what's going on in my mind the whole time we're driving away from these people? Verse two to the number of the beast. Torches blazed and sacred chants were praised. They start to cry, hands held to the sky. In the night, the fires are burning bright. The ritual has begun. Satan's work is done. Six, 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 the number of the beast. Sacrifice is going on tonight. Much like my experience with Dio in one of the previous videos. In this moment, I was palpably made aware of the reality of good and evil. And intuitively, instinctively, in my heart, I knew, dude, at some point, you've got to decide which side are you on. And not making a decision is making a decision because guess who the fence sitters belong to? They belong to the enemy. Honestly, this is where I give praise to God that I was raised in the church and that seeds of God's truth were planted in my heart because the proverb that says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is grown or when he is you know, older, he will not depart from it that was coming home to roost in me because the realities of truth that were deposited in my heart and mind, they were stirred up when I experienced things like this. It's real. You got to choose, man. Chronologically, this experience actually came before I went to see Dio. But this experience with the Dio experience, it was all part of this same season in my life when God was stirring to life a conviction and, a, and an awareness that there's good and there's evil and that I was on one side and I had to make a decision about what side I wanted to be on, man. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 15 through 19 capture perfectly the choice that God was presenting me with. Listen to these words. See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him and to keep his commands and decrees and laws. Then you will live and increase and the Lord your God will bless you. But if your heart turns away and you are not obedient, and if you are drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. This day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. 
That's powerful. That's exactly the choice God was presenting me with in that season of my life. And he was using all of my experiences at that point in my life, including Iron Maiden and the number of the beast and several of their other songs to just push me up against the wall and say, you got to make a choice. You've heard me talk about one of my best friends. We started playing guitar right around the time that Ozzy broke away from Black Sabbath and formed his own thing. And of course, if you're into this music and you're close to my age, everybody knows who Randy Rhodes was. Randy was just different. Randy had a humility about him and he had a kind of a musician's musician vibe that he gave off. He just loved the instrument and he loved music way beyond heavy metal. I mean, he was very classically oriented. And of course, this was before the day when we had YouTube and all those things where you could just watch video interviews of people. And so we were always watching the magazines. There were several magazines that we would run down to the convenience store, you know, and check out and read from cover to cover. And we came across interviews of Randy occasionally. And one of the things that Randy said in one of his interviews that was so inspiring was he talked about how when he was on tour with Ozzy, he would have people who would look up local guitar teachers for him whenever he came into town because he wanted to take lessons from the local teachers. As a kid growing up, you're new into guitar and you just look up to this guy named Randy Rose who can play, you know, this music that so inspires you and you think he can probably shred circles around these teachers. What do you mean? He needs to be teaching, not just taking lessons. But Randy said, and I, I'm totally paraphrasing, but he said, listen, everybody can do something you can't do. And so I'm always looking for something that each teacher can teach me because he just wanted to get better. That was so inspirational to me and to Paul. And then when you add Bob Daisley on the bass and Tommy Aldridge on the drums, and of course, Ozzy was quite a character and a talent in and of himself. Man, you had an incredible band. I have four memories of Ozzy that really stand out. Number one, when his first album came out, Paul and I lived over on the northeast side of Anderson and the record store that we really liked to go to was called Karma Records and it was on the southwest side of Anderson. We were 15 when that first album came out, so neither one of us could drive. And Paul's dad took us over to Karma Records. I still remember it was an Oldsmobile Delta 88, big old long four-door vehicle. And I'm sitting in the back and we're going out 38th Street toward uh, Karma Records and we come to the 109 bypass. And where 38th Street crosses 109, the road was just kind of humped a little bit uh, in terms of the, the crossroad there. I mean, we're bolting along and the light's green and we go through that intersection and I, I guess John hadn't gone through there. I mean, we'd lived there our whole life. We just didn't think about this. But that big old car, I'm sitting in the back seat and I get thrown up because nobody wore seat belts. This is 1980, right? I get thrown up in the air, hit my head on the ceiling, come down like, whoa, whoa. And I don't know why. I just remember that that happened on that car ride out to, to Karma Records to get this one particular album, Ozzy's debut album. So we get to Karma Records and there it is, man. There's the album. You remember if you went to record stores, you'd flip through and oh, there it is and it was usually in alphabetic order. You find Ozzy and you start digging through. And it's like, oh, and the artwork, it was pretty dark. But like I've said in past videos, I was dead to that kind of thing. You get the album and you bring it up to check out. And if you collected albums like I did, you know that you want to protect that artwork. And so you also buy the plastic sleeve to put the album in. And we came home and we dropped that needle and it was just like, wow, what an album, what a band. The second memory I have is of an eight track tape that I made of Ozzy Osbourne, okay? And I'm thinking back in the day, remember eight tracks? My mom had a lot of eight tracks and I took one of them because I had a stereo that would record an eight track. You could record over whatever was on there. And I stuck it in there because on one weekend evening on the local radio station, Q95 in Indianapolis, they had this show called the King Biscuit Flower Hour. Okay, maybe you've heard of it. I actually looked it up recently. It's still a thing on the web anyway. And they featured a lot of live performances, okay? And they were featured a live performance of Ozzy Osbourne on the Blizzard of Oz tour and I, mean, I stuck that 8-track in and hit record and recorded the whole show and then I added a bunch of Def Leppard I remember high and dry and on through the night stuff at the end of that and it was 8-tracks were cool because they just played continuously right and I would listen to this live show a ton I remember just the energy of that performance and hearing Randy play the improv that he dropped in there on a lot of those songs it was really 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 cool and I wore that tape out. My third distinct memory of Ozzy and specifically Randy when I think back on it was the second album of course was Diary of a Madman and in February, I wrote the date down here, February 11th of 1982, Ozzy came to Indianapolis on the Diary of a Madman tour. I was 15, soon to be 16, but not quite yet. It was going to be hard for me to get to that show as badly as I wanted to see Randy and Ozzy. I wasn't going to be able to make it. So I said, well, you know what? I'll just catch them the next time around because I'll be 16. About five 
Five weeks later, March 19th, 1982, Randy went down in that fatal crash in that plane. And um, I remember when I heard that news, I don't remember where I was or anything like that, but I just remember even as a 15 year old and at that point in your life, you know, you think you're indestructible and you're going to live forever. So when you hear about one of your heroes going down like that, he was 25 years old when he died. It was just like, dude, I mean, it really knocked me back. And um, it was it was quite a quite a moment in time. The fourth memory that I have of Ozzy, and this is driven a lot by Randy's playing as well, is sitting for hours, literally all day sometimes, in my bedroom, picking up the needle, moving it back a quarter inch and dropping it, and just working on Randy Rhodes' guitar parts over and over again. Which, by the way, if you're an aspiring guitar player and you're coming up, we've got all these blessings of YouTube and lessons and tools that you can access to help you learn how to play the guitar, and those are great. But I'm telling you what, don't short sell the value value of just listening to music over and over again and learning how to play it by ear. It's powerful. I'm so glad I learned how to play that way because it taught me how to listen to music and pick up. Now that that's that's a kick drum, that's a hi hat, that's a snare uh, you know, part. That's that's the bass. That's a synth part. That, in other words, you you learn how to listen to the parts of music and pick out notes and hear things. You develop your ear. I did end up seeing Ozzy in concert two times in Indianapolis at Market Square Arena. Both of them were with Jake E. Lee. Of course, that following year, the next tour was Bark at the Moon. Man, the opening bands for both the shows that I saw were pretty significant as well. The opening band for Ozzy on the Bark at the Moon tour, at least the leg that came through Indy, was Motley Crue on the Shout at the Devil tour, and that was a pretty significant album for them. I saw Ozzy again then the next year on the Ultimate Sin Tour. And, and, and honestly, as I just say Ultimate Sin, as a Christ follower, I think, dude, how did I fill my head with this stuff? But, you know, like I said in previous videos, I was still dead spiritually. And uh, that album cover was filled with some really, really, really dark images. But Jakey e. Lee had become a player that I really admired as well. And in April of uh, 86, they came to Indianapolis. And the opening band on that show was Metallica. A little side note, I saw Metallica twice. And it's kind of significant because I saw him on the Ride the Lightning tour at a little club in Indianapolis called the Sherwood with Wasp and Armored Saint. And then here in 86, opening for Ozzy, both times were with Cliff Burton on bass, okay? So if you're a Metallica fan, you, you kind of get the significance of that because Cliff died shortly after I saw Metallica with Ozzy on that tour. I've done three Christian parodies of Ozzy's music. Now, two of them are, of course, from the Blizzard of Oz album. The first parody, of course, was of Crazy Train. That was the big hit. That was the solo that everybody wanted to learn. And so I did a parody of that and I called it The Dragon is Slain. I'm really happy with how it turned out. Luke Weber, a great vocalist who I've worked with on a lot of different songs, he provided vocals on that song, did a great job. The second one was a parody of Mr. Crowley. Man, Randy did some incredible work on that song. And so my parody is Sister Mary. And it's about Mary from the perspective of looking at her just as a sister in the Lord and how God called her into this amazing ministry, if you will, of being the mother of the Messiah. That's what the lyrics, the perspective that they come from. And Luke provided the vocals on that as well. And then I have a third parody, Bark at the Moon. And man, I had so much fun recreating that solo from Jakey e. Lee at the end of Bark at the Moon. And uh, I sang on that one. This one is called Shoot for the Moon. And it's about receiving vision from God and aspiring to good things for the kingdom of God. I'll make sure all the links to those are in the description to this video so you can check them out. There are two reasons that I included Ozzy in this series about bands that influenced me and shaped me and that God used to bring me to Christ and make me the person that I am in Christ today. First, of course, is Randy Rhodes. Musically, the man just had an incredibly undeniable huge impact on my life. But the second reason is significant, and that is the lyrics of Ozzy Osbourne. As a teenager, following Ozzy Osbourne through the lens of whatever I could get about him through the media, Ozzy came off to me as a troubled, misunderstood, spiritually confused man who was trying to find happiness and joy in life. As a teenager, I felt very misunderstood. I was spiritually confused. My confusion was different than Ozzy's, but I was still struggling with spiritual things. And every teenager has elements of troubled feelings and, you know, unrest in their life. And so when you took Ozzy's baggage in his lyrics and, and you brought them into my world of being troubled and struggling with certain things, it really created this dysfunctional but palpable kind of 
interaction and relationship. I would listen to his lyrics and relate with so much of what he was saying, at least through the lens of my little teenage messed up world's perspective. A prime example of those lyrics would be Crazy Train. Ozzy says, crazy, but that's how it goes. Millions of people living as foes. Maybe it's not too late to learn how to love and forget how to hate. Ozzy always kind of had this vibe of, hey man, why do we have to be at each other? Why do we have to give each other a hard time? Why can't we all just get along? Well, I could certainly relate with that as a teenager. The next couple of lines, mental wounds, not healing. Life's a bitter shame. I'm going off the rails on the crazy train. I struggled to like articulate the things that those lyrics made me feel, but that whole mental wounds, not healing. You know, it's just a whole idea of getting hurt in life and holding on to those things and the scars that they leave and the struggles that you're continually over and over again having to battle and deal with and how it just brings this kind of depression and melancholy into your life. And I dealt with a lot of that as a teenager. I could just relate with those lyrics. Ozzy goes on the next verse. I've listened to preachers. I've listened to fools. I've watched all the dropouts who make their own rules. Oh my goodness. As a kid who grew up in the church, I'd heard a lot of preachers. Now, I don't know what Ozzy was talking about with that. I think he was a little bit cynical toward that, but I had heard a lot of preachers and I, even though I was living for the world, still believed in Jesus and still had a great respect for preachers of the word of God. So there was all this conflictedness going on inside of me, but that line still grabbed me. I've listened to preachers. I've listened to fools. I've watched all the dropouts. Dude, when I was in high school, some of my very best friends, and they were good dudes, and there was a genuine camaraderie and love, if you will, in terms of friendship, love amongst us of, of guys. And I won't mention their names. It doesn't really matter who they were, but these were dudes who just kind of lived to get stoned and party and have a good time. They didn't care about school or anything else. And um, had a, quite a season of my life when I was just hanging with those folks. And I totally understood that mindset of the dropouts who were just like making their own rules. So those lyrics, man, they just really spoke to so many aspects of my life and my experiences. I wrote this statement about Ozzy's lyrics, and I think this sums it up nicely. Ozzy's lyrics were by no means Christian, but they always struck me as being honest and genuine and from the heart. And I often found myself able to relate with many of the emotions and sentiments that I perceived to be coming from his lyrics. In many ways, God used Ozzy the same way he used all the other bands I've talked about in this series. He just brought the reality of the difference between good and evil and the reality that there is good and evil and that there's a choice to be made right to the forefront, man. And uh, ultimately, because of good people I had in my life who loved the Lord and were praying for me and serving as a, a great example for me and loved me even when I was in my lowest places, God brought me full circle at some point. And Ozzy's brokenness kind of showed me in a lot of ways what I didn't want to be. And so when I hit bottom and I went to my grandma in 1987, I said, I'm broke. And she said, Braddy boy, you've got to turn to Jesus, man. You just got to get out of Anderson, away from all these influences. And that's a video for another time, a story for another video, I guess is a better way to say it. I'm so thankful that uh, I had that influence. But Ozzy absolutely had a role in making me who I am today. And in 2003, after I had gotten into ministry and was serving the Lord, man, and I started discovering how to create a website and a home studio and record music, I still found myself playing a lot of things that I had learned from Randy Rhodes on those early albums. So I thank God for all those experiences and praise God. Romans 8, 28 is true. God works in all things for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. He can turn even those past chapters in your life before Christ into part of your testimony of how God works in our life to make us who we are in Christ. So I'm thankful for that, man. Dude, if you like this video right now, reach down there and hit that like button. That'll help more people see this video on YouTube. I really appreciate that. And if you think this video would be a blessing to somebody else, Else, grab the link and share it with them and leave a comment I love to hear from you man and I do my very best to read and respond to every single one if you enjoyed this video there's a couple more over here that I think you might also really really enjoy keep your eyes on Jesus and I'll catch you in the next video